I had a dream that someday I would build the finest organization in professional sports. It's a commitment to excellence to take a professional football team and give it a distinct characteristic that's different from all others. Just win. Play hard. Try not to make mistakes. But don't worry about mistakes because there's only one thing that counts. Just win. The flame that would burn brightest here is the will to win. Is the will to win. Is the will to win. Hello, Raider Nation. I'm Raider Homer. Welcome back to the Raider Mythos Theater. In the Raider Mythos Theater, we celebrate the legend of Al Davis with the players and coaches that knew him. Al's ambition and determination is a shining beacon as to how to be a Raider. Through his commitment to excellence, he built an empire in his own image, and donning the silver and black is a privilege and comes with an expectation to carry on the Raider tradition with pride and poise, also known as the Raider Way. Hey, sorry, Mr. Call, bud. Oh, Jeremy no problem. Brigham. No problem. How are you? Good. Hey, thanks for reaching out. Hey, no problem, man. I mean, thanks for coming on the show. You're the the first Raider player to come on the channel, and I really appreciate it. Oh, cool. Good deal. Yeah. and that's uh, good. You know, and so, of course, you know, I have Coach Hanson to thank for it. So, thank you, Coach Hanson. Uh, he's the one that put us in touch. Uh, so, yep. maybe you can tell us how you met Coach Hanson. Um, I met Coach Hanson when he was coaching at University of Washington. Um, he was a coach there on the defensive side of the ball. He's a guru of defense, but I believe he was a defensive line uh, assistant to Randy Hart, who's a legendary uh, defensive line coach, Washington and Stanford and a couple other places. Ohio State, I think he played at. But, yeah, so that's how I met um, Randy um, through the University of Washington connection. Did you uh, ever watch any film with them? Um, no, I, I watched. Uh, I mean, I just remember in passing watch, watching stuff with him um, as a as a player in college. You know, we we'd meet with the different positions, and we'd meet at times with the defensive staff, and they you know go over stuff that they wanted us to do on offense. So yeah, I, but not not in particularly do I remember him and I. Uh, but but recently we've watched film and discussed film over the years. Um, I've used him kind of as a mentor for some secondary and, and defensive things for sure. He's a, he's really good at that. His knowledge is a step above, yeah. especially in the secondary and defensive side of the ball. Yeah, man. He, uh, he has a, he knows a lot about football. I talked yep. to him for like three hours, one night, like an hour and a half the next night setting up his interview. It was a blast. I learned a lot from him. Yeah. I try to, he's really, he's really high energy and, it's really it's really fun to, to talk to guys who are really passionate, and I think that I'm pretty passionate. But he's one of those guys where it's like, wow, you just like being around guys that are that great and that much energy. And, you know, one time when I called him, I knew we were going to talk football, and I I made sure to have a double shot of coffee <laughs> just so I could keep it up because of the detail. So well, it's good the, it's good talking to him. Yeah, and so you know, you went to uh, college. You played college ball with them, right? Yeah, University of Washington and so, in Seattle. Uh, so that was before he became a Raider. I mean, that's kind of cool that both of y'all became Raiders, you know? Yeah, we, we, we both became Raiders, and, uh, you know, he had a good relationship with Al Davis. And, you know, it, it was kind of com- not common knowledge, but Al Davis had certain people that he liked or he, he you know, that he liked. And Randy was one of those guys, from what I understand. And uh, I feel like I was, too. One time, uh, John Gruden, we were walking out uh, to practice in the morning, and I remember distinctly that he, he looks over at me, and it's probably 9, 9.30 for an offensive walkthrough. You know, you'd have your training in the morning, 7 to 8, you'd lift, and then you'd have special teams, 8 to 9, then offense, 9 to 11. Then you'd do your walkthrough from, like, 11 to 12, and it'd be a run-through where you're full sweat. I mean, it's not a walkthrough. It's, it's a run-through. Don't screw it up. It's NFL. You don't screw up. Mm-hmm. You're focused. You're detailed. And I'm walking out to the field. It's like, hey. Jeremy, do you know you have a fan club? I'm like, I have a fan club? What? He goes, yeah, it's called the Al Davis fan club. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and I go, oh, okay. But that was the day they had, like, um, uh, probably the time when everybody got their contract for the next year. So he was, you know, I was really close to John Gruden, too. But but uh, he made that comment. I didn't, I didn't even know. I'm like, is that a, is that a put down? Is that a compliment? <laughs> <laughs> I took it as a compliment. I mean, I thought. 
Al Davis is a legend. I mean, oh, yeah. he'd walk onto the plane and he'd, he'd walk about three or four people and he'd shake a hand and then he'd walk about three or four more people and he'd shake a hand. And everybody, I, I was one of those hands he would shake. He'd go four or five on the plane and, and shake those hands. And then Al Locasal, he'd kind of do the same thing. His his right-hand man, mm-hmm. um, he's a really good guy. But I'd just be on the plane and I just happened to be, you know, one of those select guys. So he'd come by always and say hi to me. But he'd walk by. And there'd be like an executive or somebody that would actually be sitting with me. You know, we'd have a, back then it was Hawaiian Airlines. I don't know what it is now, but probably like seven to nine seats in, in my section, like just in my row. And there's maybe three guys. And every once in a while, there'd be like some executive or somebody who works up in the front office or, you know, does tickets or do something that's there. And when Mr. Davis would walk by, you know, the guy might be playing, you know, blackjack on his computer. And all of a sudden, that laptop is flat, his back is straight, and he is on attention, waiting for Mr. Davis to give him his eye contact. It's just He's just a legend. He demanded that. You know, there's those people that are just, he's a legend. I mean, just, there's no way to put it in football. That, that so reminds it was just me cool. Of this, yeah, that reminds you know? me of the stories. I think uh, I think it was Howie Long that was saying it, you know, that uh, the Raiders would be sitting around, the players would be sitting around on their helmets and things like that on the practice field, and as soon as that stood up and, you know, paid attention to what was going on, you know? Yeah, it was like, I don't know, maybe like in the Army, like a general or somebody walks by. It's just everybody is at attention. I mean, there's, he just had that, he had that respect. But, I mean, you know, when you merge the AFL and the NFL and all the things that he did and all the championships and, you know, the image that he made of the Raiders, and you know, you kind of deserve that. Yeah, you know. that respect. So, but yeah, this is a, just a lot of times he 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 sent my brother. Uh, my brother is in the army, and he was in like Tajikistan, somewhere near Russia or an Arab country, and he um, he sent them shirts. My brother, I guess, had asked them for shirts, or somehow they got connected, but didn't even tell me. And uh, he, this is back when. Um, after 9-11 happened, so everybody was really kind of aware of what was going on in the, that side of the world. So he would always ask me about every week or so, you know, details, what's going on over there. He was really interested in what was going on in, in some of the issues that were happening uh, foreign-wise. But he sent shirts to my brother in the Army, and he didn't even tell me. Like, he would just do generous things like that. That's cool. Now, that, I mean, didn't happen all the time, but everybody talks about an Al Davis story where he did something really nice but he didn't really want any credit for it it was good like that that's awesome yeah Yeah, i love you know sharing al davis memories on this channel that's that's a big goal of mine i was a huge al davis fan i'm a mark davis fan now you know the davis family is the raiders so it's awesome to hear those kinds of stories yeah it always be i mean everybody likes the silver and black and and the team and i guess you know, with Mark leading, leading it, then it's, it's always in the Davis realm. But you know, people still just, Al Davis has that, you know, presence. Yeah. I was talking to Randy a while ago on the phone one day. I'm like, he told me, I, I overheard, maybe I maybe I watched on TV and it said something about Al Davis. I'm like, you know what? Maybe Al Davis is looking down happy we're talking, you know, because it's just, you know, people that Al Davis was somewhat close to. So I, I believe in that stuff. And I, maybe he's looking down happy that we're, sitting talking about the Raiders and talking about him because he he, he bled silver and black. Oh, yeah. and he was just, everything that he did was, you know, I can't say enough. So did you grow up a Raider fan? Uh, my, my brothers always um, liked uh, Snake. So we always had that book. Mm-hmm. My brothers would always have, you know, books that we were reading. They always end up somehow in the restroom to so be reading football books. And there was a Snake book. My older brother was really into him. And uh, so it was great when I got to meet him up in Napa and also at uh, Angela and Fred Blitnikoff's golf tournaments every year. Yeah, um, that's cool. What happened with him health-wise later on, but another super legend. Um, but, yeah, growing up, I just kind of followed who I remember, like, Dan Marino. And just, you know, as a young kid, um, I liked the Dolphins in Denver, but uh, my family always liked the Raiders. My older brother, who's also in the Army, he was a diehard. So you always heard of the Raiders when you're, I was in Arizona, never liked the Cardinals, um, but I, I never, never followed them, but um, my family liked the Raiders always. So surely they all had an 87 Brigham jersey, right? Oh, I'm sure now they do. I got to send my brother one, yeah. 
That's cool. My wife jokes. She's like, you give away your Raider jerseys. These are the real things. You can't get them back. But my older brother doesn't ask me for much. He's like, hey, my daughter, she really likes Kronkowski because they're from New England. And he's like, but it'd be really cool if you got an 87 Brigham. I'm like, I got one and I sent it. That's so it's <laughs> really like, cool. so I have about two left. But yeah, it's always fun. I mean, I remember watching, reading, um, actually playing the Madden games. And uh, the first time, everybody's like, what was it? What was the first time you really felt like you were in the NFL? And to me, it was way back 1998 when Madden, the first one, I was on. And it was, I just looked at it and it says Brigham and I was playing Madden. It's like, whoa, because I was a video game guy. Yeah. That to me was, I made it. You do to yourself every play, right? Uh, you can substitute. I made myself running back on my friends, <laughs> you know, go down the goal line. Oh, let me, let me switch myself in and run it in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although, because I was a lot of times I was a backup, it was always uh, played a lot, but you know, a lot of times they'd put my stats. Sometimes, sometimes they'd be good, sometimes they wouldn't be good. So that's when I would search me to running back. Were you uh, uh, were you returning kicks in Madden? No, I, I never returned kicks. I returned <laughs> them in a game when I kick, they kicked them short. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing: in the NFL, if you're kick returning a kick, you got to understand you got to have your head on a swivel because the guys they send down there on kickoff coverage have serious speed <laughs> so if you're you, if you're a medium speed guy it was a very fast tight end but not for a receiver but i remember returning a kick in the nfl was is squib short and it, it was there's a rule if it's in front of you you know you can fall on it if it's behind you let it go well this one was right at me it was like not in front not behind so i grabbed and i had probably made about seven yards and those felt like the longest seven yards ever <laughs> and it was just boom 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 it was something I, I never experienced, the, the speed. Yeah. Everybody's similar in size at Washington. The strength, there's guys who can bench similar strengths and squats, and but the speed is something you can't recreate in the NFL. You know, so. Yeah, yeah. so, okay, well, so how old were you when you started playing football? I, uh, surprisingly, I played um, only my senior year of high school. I played one year of Pop Warner when I was a little kid. My my older brother was the coach. He's also the the army. He's a general. He's a big deal. My coach and I broke my thumb like in my second game. I remember I was playing defensive line and he's like, "It's not broken. Get back in the game." I, I didn't know it was broken. I was a little kid. I was like, "But it hurts. It hurts." And then we went in the next day and it was broken. So I played a game in, in Pop Warner on a broken thumb. It was funny. Man. But no, so I only yeah yeah I didn't know. It was just your older brother, somebody you look up to, is all get back in. Yeah, that wouldn't tough. fly these days. <laughs> No, 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 no. Yeah, they wouldn't. But you know, there's there's good reasons for that, and then yeah. there's also sometimes maybe you guys are a little bit too soft. But there's others to be protective for sure. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I played about two games in Pop Warner, and then I hung it up, and I played my senior year. I just didn't want to regret it. My my dad was talking to me, and he was a big football guy, and he you know just talking. To him, I don't want to you know go through life saying I never played football. Yeah. So I just called him. You know, I didn't even go to spring ball. I called him the storm. Ended up going and then played uh, basketball and got recruited by University of Washington um, at the end of the football season. They came to a basketball game and I had like two alley oop dunks and I got in a fight with a guy. Not a fight, but you know, a little physical one you'd do in basketball. And the, the offensive coordinator at Washington was at the game and he said that basketball game showed him I had the, the passion, you know, and the fight that was needed, not literally. But uh, so yeah, that's that's I ended up playing one year in, in uh, football in high school. But I was to track. I made it to the states in track in the hundred and two hundred. So I always had the, the size and frame. I just didn't have a ton of experience because I really like basketball. But I knew with my height, you know, about a hair under six five, and I could run, you know, fast forty yard dash. Figured I had a lot better chance. Um, in football than being a six foot five power forward can't really dribble so it's not going to cut it so the um, Washington came coming that was the first kind of big deal because they had the Rose Bowl and uh, so I went there for five years a red shirted um, the team went on probation the first year I was there so but I decided to stay uh, rather than leave they ended up talking to all the players because he had the option of transferring different schools that had offered us but you know, everybody stayed at Washington, and it was a good program. There was a lot of good players. Um, Lincoln Kennedy was there, Washington. That's cool. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of any other Huskies. 
um, you always see them coming coming through. You know, it's kind of cool. Sometimes guys come for like a tryout period, or some guys are there in the summer, so or in the spring. So it's always good to see some guy. Eric Bjornson, he came a little bit. He was with the Cowboys, he, and then he he came at the end with the Raiders. He was a superstar in college. So it was it was crazy for me because he was like the man. He was a starting receiver, but he also played quarterback almost the entire senior year. He rotated in, so he was a big deal. And then he came to Huskies, and he was, you know, competing with me for a spot. Sorry, came to Oakland. So it was just – it's kind of surreal sometimes when you're playing against guys that you, like, you know, at one place you, you look up to them like, oh, my, they're a god. You can never reach them. And then you're there in the Raiders, and they're, you know, equal with you. Or, you know, you're kind of going to get the spot, and they're fighting to, to be the third spot. It's just kind of surreal sometimes how the NFL works. Yeah. Different than college where it's all kind of projected out and you could kind of see how it's going to happen. The NFL, you know, it could change. So, you know, well, what was your favorite part about college football? Uh, college football. I don't know the guys, the training. I like weightlifting and, and I really liked training in college. Um, to me, you know, the, the off season program, it was my first experience to really lifting and, and, and protein shakes and they provide all that stuff. So it's kind of fun as a kid, you know, and you have, you know, I don't know, you just have really good, really good training and really good coaches. And you just, you know, 72,000 uh, people at University of Washington Husky Stadium and they claim they um, created the wave. No. Uh, that was what they always said. Uh, I didn't, never verified it, but that's what it always would say, that the wave started there. So just, I don't know, I guess the stadium, University of Washington, as a young kid, Coming out of area, they packed it every. No matter if you played San Jose State, uh, and I know, I don't know your background, U of A or Bay Area. I know you, uh, Texas. Yeah. But I'm also, Boston, but yeah. it's not a put down San Jose State. But uh, back there, when you're playing, I mean, it is kind of a put down. They don't think they're very good at Washington, but it would be packed. I do not remember a game that wasn't sold out. So it's just a different vibe of fan. Hmm. It's kind of like Raiders, the diehard, except. They're in college. They're there at every game. And I don't know how they do it with the tickets, but that place is sold out no matter who you're playing. So to me, you can hear that they bring the boats in. And the Lake Washington is right there on the stadium. It's one of the most beautiful stadiums. It just looks out at the lake. So everybody, a lot of people tailgate and bring their big boats in. So we would always have a, um, a police escort coming into the game on our buses. And you'd see those guys. And I'm like, someday I'm going to go in one of those big boats, you know, and you know, have a relaxing time because that looks really good. And I'm sitting there on the on the uh, bus, like nervous, looking over my special team stuff or looking over my offensive stuff. So I just remember that, thinking those guys are lucky. But yeah, it's really beautiful. I just missed, you know, the weather, the people. It's kind of different vibe and being a student athlete, and you know, you're young, so you I don't know, feel like kind of important. Where high school is, you know, everything's kind of taken for granted. Here, you know, people are starting to look at it like you're 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 semi successful in your life, what you're doing. You know? Mm-hmm. So but I, I and then in the NFL, I you know, that's completely completely different. It's like a boys it's just, I describe it to people, it's like a being part of a VIP golf club, men's club that you have to pay a lot to get into and you're just part of this group and it's just like it doesn't matter if you're Jerry Rice or Jeremy Brigham, you're in. And your equals. Where in college, you know, the freshman and the senior are not equals. It's just they're not. If you're a guy who might be drafted, and you're, or you're just a, a guy on the team who's trying to make the team, you guys are not equal. Whatever, for whatever reason in college, that's how they do it. But in the pros, once you make it, you're in. You're equal. That's how I would describe it. So watch college, I, I really enjoyed it. But pros, I really enjoyed because you're kind of in, in club where it's kind of, you only have a few people that, you know, like Randy, we're talking about Randy, or, you know, or, or, or Howie or other people, you know, they've all done that. They may have done it longer or they may have done it at, at, you know, more pro bowls, but they've all experienced, you know, training camp in Napa or, or California, or Southern California, or dealing with Mr. Davis, Mark Davis, and Al Locasal. They, they all have their own little stories. And it's kind of like, you're just part of a, a unique group that not a lot of people get to be, on the inside of yeah yeah that's why it's cool to have you come on the channel you know and and that's what makes it cool for players to go on other podcasts so that you know people like us 
that didn't experience that, you know, we get an inside look at it. I mean, because, yeah, we see you all guys on TV smashing each other's heads, but, you know, it's cool to see what y'all's story, you know, was, how y'all's journey developed, you know? Yeah, yeah but, I mean, it's, it's cool to listen also, though, you know, how you guys break down and all your you know, expertise on data and how you guys can, you know, see player stats and, and, and understand football and understand, you know, what moves are being made and all the details that are so important. But, you know, on this side, we get some experience that, you know, we're in the room from time to time and we heard certain stories or certain things that, you know, people just haven't had access to, you know, not that I know that I know more. It's just, you know, more time around Mr. Davis or more time around, you know, Al Locasal or John Gruden or however it may be that, you know, we take for granted but other people to tell the stories like, Oh my gosh, that's so cool. You know, mm-hmm. but it's just being part of it. We were just blessed. You know, the years that I was there, there was a lot of good players and we, we won. Yes. We didn't win the Super Bowl, but we played in the Super Bowl. We should have won. We played against our old coach. It was just, it was kind of surreal, but it's just a lot of great players that, you know, didn't really appreciate it when you're there. And then you leave, you're like, wow, those are some good Raider teams. Those are some good Raider players. Well, yeah, you know, and they're they're oh, yeah. good again. Brown they're rise, come back. Brown rise. Yeah. You know, I loved watching that. You know, uh, Tyrone Wheatley and Gardner. Yep. You know, yep. Lincoln Kennedy was really good. Gannon yep. was my one of my favorite Raiders for a long time. You know, Tim Brown. Yep. I mean, you came in yep. with Charles Woodson. Uh, you yep. came in with John Ritchie. That guy was bleeding all over the place. I know. He, yeah. he, that was like calcium deposits on his uh, on his head that was caused by the helmet. Uh huh. But it's funny, we'd always joke because he was just a gladiator. He was a, you know, hardcore guy from Stanford. We were roommates when we came in. And he, he's smart as a whip. He'll sit and play Jeopardy, and he could pretty much beat anybody. So it's like uh, he'd sit around and play different game, game shows on, on when you're watching TV. But uh, he, he would uh, – that thing would bleed, you know, just – it would just keep coming. So sometimes he would do it. And we were always joke NFL films was there. It would be really bleeding. And we're like, yeah. yeah. Did you do that for NFL films? Yeah, right. You did that on Those purpose. Those calcium deposits again. I know they always bleed anyway. But <laughs> it looks like you're the Viking. But no, no. He was a he was a gladiator. That guy was tough. He yeah, was smart. He, he was one of my favorite writers. I mean, of course, yeah. I, I can say that about any of y'all. But, you know, yeah. I, I enjoyed watching him play. Well, we do signings together too when we're rookies in our next year, and John had a big fan following. Oh yeah, you know. So he's, I was, yeah. Uh, yeah he he would you'd go and there was always the Richie fans. It was just fun because he's you know he's he's super smart and he's super cerebral and he'd come up with some fun stuff. But he was a good player, so it was just it was fun to see some of the Richie fans. It, you didn't know he had some particular fans until you'd go to a signing you do together, you know, at one of their the Raider spots and. uh He'd have the Richie fans. It was fun. But yeah, Charles Woodson, um, Bill Romanowski. Oh, yeah. Uh, Trace Armstrong. He was a great defensive end. Roderick um, Coleman. Yeah, Roderick. I remember Roderick. Eric Barton. First, yeah, Eric Barton. He was great, too. Um, I remember Roderick was a fr- rookie. Guys come in, and I pro- you probably heard this before, but there's this kind of rookie. Th- when you show up as a rookie, it doesn't matter if you're all pro, you know. You are behind. You're not used to the speed. Mm-hmm. You're not used to practicing getting the door knocked on by somebody from the hotel at 6 and then knocking on it again at 11 to put your butt in bed. And now they don't – they may be one practice now, but they used to have two full padded practice. And and then you'd, um, you, you know, practice for two and a half hours. They'd have the weights outside of there in Napa where you'd lift after practice, and then you'd go – get an hour or two nap in just enough time for your, you know, to feel tired and then you're up again and you'd go out to practice again for three more hours. And then you go into meetings, you'd have a quick dinner and go into meetings from six to 10 and maybe your relaxing time would be 10 to 11. Boom. You got to do it again. So it's just, it's a different level. So rookies would get there. And I remember Roderick was this big defensive tackle, but at first I could block him all the time. I was like, this guy's easy. For like two weeks in camp, I don't know what it is, but once the rookies kind of get established and figure it out, then they start becoming the player that, you know, if they were a great player in college, they start becoming that player again. But I remember being able to block Roderick for like two weeks consecutively thinking, this guy's crap. And then he ended up just (laughs) 
I did. I remember thinking that. And then he just became a beast. Yes, I mean, he could, he by the end of his time, he could maul me. You know, I'd, I'd have to try to cut him. I'd have to try to do anything I could. Because he just, I don't know what it is. And you could talk to players. And you, a lot of times it has to do with, like, offensive linemen and defensive linemen and tight ends and blocking. You're just not there those first few weeks. Your your mind, your psyche, you're not using your hands the way they do. You just have to get used to it. You know, I remember – so the, yeah, the Roderick, he became a beast. I just remember that clearly, but I remember running for, you know, running a shallow cross in a, in a breaking kind of drag route, but across the field. And, uh, so I'd go to make my move and I kind of just make a move with my hips and cut. And usually I could separate a little bit on that as a receiver, but I remember in the NFL, they were right with me the entire time. And I'm just like, I could not get open in the first mini camp. And I was just frustrated. Like, Oh my goodness. Like, this is not going to be easy. Usually I can use my speed and make a little move and have a little separation. We're here. It's not every, so that you have to work on every little detail of, you know, extending your arm out, never keeping them in short, you know, using your hips, using precise footwork, you know, yeah. making moves on the, you just, you have to, the details or you will not the get open. You will, everybody's your same speed. Everybody works hard. There's not, I, I coach high school and, in college and, and I coached in Italy the last two years. I could tell you about that if you want later, but I told the guys, you know, here at high school, you know, working hard is a great thing. And, you know, the, the guys that work hard are our top players in the NFL. Everyone works hard. It's not even an honor to be called the hard worker. You know, I remember Gruden wrote in an article that the hardest two workers on the Raiders were Jeremy Brigham and John Ritchie. He said it in an article my dad sent to me, but in Everybody expects to do that in the NFL. It's not, it's not that big of a deal because everyone does it. Where in college and high school, that really separates you your work ethic. But in the NFL, I mean, you have to have the work ethic. Everybody's the same speed, the same, pretty much the same intellect, everything, like right across the board. So you have to find a way to do more. And in the NFL, you know, you got to be driven to do even more. So, I mean, to me, that was what the difference was was. When I arrived there, that rookie, same thing with, with Roderick, that rookie, you know, you just have to find some specific technique on everything you do. So if you're not focused on really becoming a good football player and if you're just playing for the money or this and that, you're not going to get it done unless you're like a Terrell Owens or just, you know, a freak athlete that come every once in a while, you know. Mm-hmm. So like Woodson, when he was young, he could, you know – there were stories of him sleeping in meetings and, and, you know, cause he just had such good speed and, and he was such a good player coming out of college and he was young. And then what I was happy to see when he became, when he got older and in green Bay and in Oakland, he became a serious leader. He became a serious football player as far as the X's and O's. Cause he was always a, a unbelievable athlete. I mean, every once in a while they'd split out the tight ends and Woodson would cover you. And it was just a joke. He wouldn't even be really looking at you. He'd be backpedaling as fast as you're full sprinting, and he's looking and not even at you. So, I mean, but it was good to see him later on. He became a super leader and really got in shape, and I was just so impressed with how many years he continued to play because there was just talk initially that he might not be as dedicated. I never saw it. I just saw him. He was always the leader of the Raiders, and he was, you know, all pro every year when I was there. But there was just things I heard maybe once in a while he'd sleep in meetings or something because he was so good. Yeah. I never saw that, but I know later on, I mean, he became super duper leader, team, team centered guy, everything. But Woodson's a super stud. He was always a good person and always a great, great, great player. But it was amazing to see him play so long and, uh, you know, so ferociously for so many years. Yeah. Uh, so. yeah, I was a Woodson fan. Like I said, you know, I remember in 1998, you know, I didn't have cable, so I had to, uh, wait until I got to school and look at the newspaper to see if, if we drafted him because I really wanted him to be a Raider. And, of course, we did. So I thought that was awesome. You know, and so, you know, now that we're talking about 1998, you know, that's when you were drafted. So when it came time for you to prepare for the draft, how did you prepare for the draft? Um, for the draft, you know, it was um, <clears throat> it was the same as uh, – same year as Woodson, yeah. And uh, – I prepared. I got the call. I was in Washington, and I was up in the coaches' offices. I got a call for the combine, and there's a combine where also players can kind of pay for it, 
and kind of get looks. I don't know how it works. It's kind of like secondary combine. You know, it's probably there's probably more than that nowadays. But so I my immediate answer was, now is this the real combine? This guy called me. Hi, I'm so and so with the combine. You know, we'd like to invite you to the combine. I'm like, is this the real combine? That was my first thing. I'm like, he's like, yeah, this is the NFL combine. So I immediately it was like six weeks out. So I immediately just really training because you know I, I wanted to do what he really wanted me and was going to you know I could make this a career I was going to do it but I just want to be a walk tech guy, guy who you know was always trying to get on I, w- I wanted to be wanted so as soon as I knew that the the combine wanted me I know that was serious so I put it in high gear and I you know I trained hard for about six weeks you know had I had I known longer I would have probably hired in the draft but you know I was training and doing the Springfield test in the 10 yard dashes for time over and over and over i was running you know i was doing cardio lifting and just really trying to get in physical shape i had quarterbacks throwing to me non-stop neighbors over and over and over because i knew that you know you get a small window and you work out in front of all those coaches and you got to look good in that test you know and i you know the the nfl ball is just a very soft ball i was able really able to catch that ball in workouts so I was just, you know, I was lucky that when I worked out, I, I, I caught every pass except one. I was the fat, I tied for first in the 40-yard dash, the combine, and uh, you know they must have, they must have liked it. The Raiders team that didn't, didn't call me during the draft. The idea of the Raiders were me. I was going to pick me. They called me third round. They were asking me about Dallas. I said, you know, I really wait, wait, like wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, yeah. The right, Ra- you're, you're breaking up. Can you, okay. Okay, so the Raiders did not contact you. Yep. They didn't contact me during the draft until they drafted me. They didn't interview me. Nothing. Well, who gave so, you the call? Uh, the, the call was um, Bill Callahan and then Gruden. He handed the phone over to Gruden after that, and he gave me the classic, do you love football line? And I said, of course, I love football. That was his favorite line. <laughs> but I was just uh, – so the uh, the neighbor had uh, like a frat party going on. So we're watching ESPN, and it's like the Oakland Raiders select, and it flashes, flashes, flashes. Tight end Jeremy Brigham, I don't know, 120th pick or something, like 127th pick. And me and my brother are jumping up and down, screaming, "Yeah, we did it!" At the neighbor, I mean, the neighbor's like 10 feet away. It's in a dorm type of situation. So we're jumping up and down, cheering. And these people are kind of drunk, or not drunk, but they're, you know, they slept late from their, their parties or whatever they were doing the night before. They were just looking at us with this weird, bewildered look. It was a classic moment where I had no idea. And the next thing I know, it's Bill Callahan and John Gruden on the phone within minutes. You know, th- so everything kind of changed. I like the, uh, the videos we see from the 2019 draft, huh? When he called yep. you? It's similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely call right away and you know super super excited and everything kind of changes but the Raiders did a really good job I don't know if they do that all the time somehow I heard they do maybe they don't with like their first round picks or you know their top in the top 10 you know super quarterback guy picked in the top 10 of the first round but you know they did all their research they didn't even really talk to me personally and then they just picked me where other teams would call you constantly just checking in on you you know Cowboys Baltimore Kansas City sent out a coach to meet me twice, um, but Oakland grabbed me, so it was like, it was great. Nice. Yep. Okay, so earlier you had talked about Al Davis, but what was it like to meet Al Davis for the first time? Uh, the first time, you know, he comes in from a distance, and he walks in with his cool Raiders jumpsuit, and I just remember I had a really good practice. You know, my second or third day, I had a really good day. And I caught, like, a diving pass, and everybody cheered. And Bruce Allen, who was uh, the player, uh, president, manager that back then with Al, was like, if we would have known you were this good, we would have drafted you later. Well, sorry, earlier. But, you know, a few days later, I started peeking, like I said, about rookies. And I was kind of in the tank for a few weeks, you know, being kind of miserable because you're just not used to it. And then after I recharged and I was good to go. But at first, I really was, you know, at peak, and they were surprised that I could catch the ball and run. But so I just remember seeing him come from the field, and it's the first time I met him, I, um, I he saw me playing in, in in training camp. I do not remember meeting him before training camp. Obviously, it probably did happen, 
but uh, I remember in training camp seeing him just from a distance in the weight room in Napa, and you see him way over there, and he walks in, you know, to practice probably, you know, after stretch or maybe 20 minutes after practice is gone, and you see him walk up, and but you can see the, you know, the legendary uh, suits that he's wearing, the the silver, or the white, or the black Raider gear, and when he comes out, you know, you'd always uh, want to perform. Uh, years ago, James Jett, he was a super receiver. He was a track star. Or, like, yeah, I remember him. Alternate on the Olympic 100 4 by one And there was always jokes because whenever Al was there, he'd have like an 80-yard bomb and he'd catch it. And they'd be like, yeah, his dad's here. It was always a funny thing. James <laughs> would always perform in practice when Al Davis is around. I mean, he always he did well. He's, he's a great player. But whenever Mr. Davis is around, he somehow turned it up and was all pro every second. <laughs> Whenever I would be at practice. But, yeah, there's just little things you remember as we're talking about him. But, you know, I just remember seeing him from a distance. I, I remember seeing Gruden and him talking. After Davis talking and John Gruden standing and listening and talking and giving him good eye contact. But also John was able to also communicate his his vision also, but very respectful. So, you know, to me, John Gruden and, and Al Davis were a good combination. You know, even if it ended, however the press say it ended, when John left in the middle of the night or he was traded, but I remember just always seeing I remember in training camp just seeing John Gruden after practice because I'd be running or doing something, you know, half hour after practice was over. And they'd be talking. It'd be in the morning after a long training camp practice, and they'd be both standing there. And, you know, Mr. Davis would be talking, and John would usually be listening. But it was just – it's just those type of things you remember. You know, I remember – one time I was hitting this big – there's a big blocking bag at training camp that they have. It's like – it'd be like a punching bag, but it's like 400 pounds, and it's super round. It's like a really fat punching bag, really heavy. And you use it for pass protection or you just get stronger hands, you know. You have good you – know, your head and chest – your head and shoulders behind your chest, and you're, you're shooting your hands inside and really firing it off, you know, like 90%. And I'm, I'm miserable. It's in camp. I'm working with um, – uh, what was his name? Bill Callahan, the uh, head coach for me at the end, but he was my tight end coach. He's an offensive line guru. And I'm working with him, and he's making me hit the pad, and it's in the summer. And you've been there a few weeks, and you're a rookie, and you're fatigued. You are just tapped out. And they just expect another level of you, and you have to find a way, you know. And because it's not like a job you can just get rid of. You, you, you're you getting paid a lot of money, yeah. but it is really putting the stress on you. And people don't understand because, you know, even though you're making a ton of money, they put that on you. At some point, some people kind of crack up, you know, and because it's so hard. So I'm getting there, and it's just really hard. And Mr. Callahan's having me hit this big bag. And then Al Davis comes over, and Al Davis is watching me. And then who's at practice also? John Madden. So Al calls John Madden over, and they're watching me, and Bill's having me do all these drills. And I'm just laughing. I'm like, at the beginning of practice, you hated this. You didn't want to be here in my mind. And then – now, Al Davis and John Mann are coaching you up and watching it. I just like, this is one of those memories and stories that, you know, not many people get to live. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, and that was one of those times. And it was just one other quick one I'll share. Jerry Rice, when he came to the Raiders, you know, there was a big difference because I was there for four, three years, and then Jerry came for two years that I was there, and then I hurt my knee. But when Jerry came, it was like we were there for three years, and we were very good. But Jerry came, and it was like Michael Jordan was at this at the facility. I mean, cameras were there. You just noticed it. You noticed it's probably 30% more cameras everywhere he went. It was just my first experience about being around a Michael Jordan-type superstar. But he was so humble. But I remember we're in, in um, practice and walkthrough, and East, the tight end, was on the inside, and the receiver, with Jerry, was on the, the X receiver. He was the – might have been the Z receiver. He was on the outside of me. And he was like, East, what are we doing? I'm like, Jerry, remember East, the tight end's on the inside because it's warm. And I just remember I stopped. And I'm like, Jerry's like, hey, thanks. And I was like, I just told Jerry Rice what to do. <laughs> that was another moment was in my head like, wow, this is surreal. You know, the Madden video, the game, telling Jerry Rice what to do. John Madden and Al Davis sitting watching me, like coaching me up like they like me, like they think I have potential. There's just times like that. It's like, wow. Yeah, you know, if my awesome. buddies at home who didn't think I was very good could see this, how you like me now. You know, it was just a great, uh, just those little experiences like that. You know, those type of people. But I just remember Al Davis from a distance. And I remember he was always really nice. There was a game, you know, he's like, if you guys win, I'm going to get you guys all these great sports jackets uh, when we were playing Denver. And, you know, 
he just do nice little things to motivate you. He put you up in the greatest hotels. You know, he just did good things for you. And, and I talked to people who were Bay Area people that maybe were mad when they moved back to L.A. They were older. And I just, he just, as a player, he just always took care of us. He expected the most out of us, but he really put us up in nice hotel. Napa is, you know, you train your butt off, but it's a good place to be. The facility, the planes that he flew us on, you know, the, the little perks he does for the players. He just really took care of his players. And, he, he, you know, people didn't see that side. He really focused on making you feel positive and making you feel like you could do your best. He'd tell you when you didn't and you you get a question, like a random question, you know, do you like to run a post or what do you think about running a post? And then he'd tell you, well, you didn't run the post correctly or you're too slow. But he would tell you in a nice way or he'd question it and you'd get it and you didn't want to be asked those questions. So you'd work really hard to not. But he always just, he created a positive environment that and I tell players now too that I coach, you know, at the NFL it's about really being positive because you're there. They want to they want to see you develop and grow. And and he really he was really able to do that, you know, well. But I don't think a lot of people know that aspect of Al Davis and you know, because he was part of my language, kind of a badass in football and a legend and everybody admired him and respected him, but he also could develop and he said an environment was really positive amongst the players. You know, you felt like you wanted to do well. And it was that that's initial, like, you know, you're in a VIP club because everybody's together, part of a unit, and you're trying to do well. It's not, it's competitive, but, you know, it's long enough. You kind of, it's, it's going to happen. You got your chance to beat somebody out, but it's just, you know, it's a unit. You want everybody to, to be part of it and part of the team. And somehow Al Davis was able to make it really positive. And Gruden kind of grasped on that too and made it positive where it was very hard, you were expected to work hard, and if you didn't do, didn't work hard or screwed up, obviously you are going to find out about it big time, but it was really positive where you weren't nervous. You felt more like you wanted to be part of this program with, with Gruden and, and with Al Davis. It was something bigger. And I'm hoping that they get that back, and I, I'm, I'm sure they will. But when we were there, oh, yeah. I was just lucky enough to be on that team with those great players, but it was just – it was something about being part of the Raiders, and it was something about knowing you could win everything. You know, you, you knew you could. It's just like, are we going to screw it up? Not, could we beat these guys? That never was there. It was, you know, is somehow we're going to screw this one up, or is he going to have a bad night? But not, did we ever fear anybody? <clears throat> you know? Yeah, so. you know, you're talking about a lot of great and awesome Raider legends, you know? Yep. So, you know, you played with a lot of them, but yep. uh, let's talk about Rich Gannon. You know, what kind okay. of relationship did you have with Rich, and, you know, what was he like in the huddle, you know, and, and, on, and yeah. on the sideline and that practice? I, I had a great relationship with Rich. Um, you know, when we were – I went to um, a great camp in, in Hawaii that a lot of players went, like a fishing NFL camp where you go. So I got to meet with him my, my first year I was there, and, I did an interview on Jeff Garcia, my agent, um, Steve Baker. He was San Francisco. He's a big time agent. And he represented Jeff Garcia and John Ritchie and a couple other people. Um, the guy, oh, I forget the girl's name. Um, Jessica Simpson's husband, uh, he represented him too, uh, the singer. I forgot his name. <clears throat> but um, so we went to this uh, camp in Hawaii, and Rich was like, hey, how come you, I watched that um, show you went on? How come you went on Jeff Garcia's show? He's like, and hey, he didn't even thank me. I thank like Tim Brown because it talked about you know first player that you met and what you thought. And I just remember Tim Brown was the first one that really was like, "Good job, welcome to the Raiders." I caught a pass in mini camp, and but I always admired Rich Gannon, you know, because he's a great player and he's super smart. I went on this Jeff Garcia show that my agent got me on. It was his client, and Jeff was um, hosting a television show, and it was. Um, it was in San Francisco, and it was a big deal, and I was just impressed that Rich Cannon took the time to watch the show of me and was telling me, hey, how come you didn't mention me, this and that? And from then on, you know, I always made it a point to try to do anything I could with Rich Cannon. Um, he was, John Gruden and him were super tight. You know, once in a while they would argue, and you, you'd see it like two brothers arguing. You know, it would happen like once every two months. And it would happen at the end of practice or maybe in a walkthrough or just something when it wasn't, you know, in practice. So, and they, Gannon would like kind of pop off, not negatively, just about something because, you know, John is, is a perfectionist with developing and, you know, 
Gannon was an older player, so and they were almost John the guru of offense. So you know, I remember that, but I was always tried to stay as close as possible to Gannon because you want to catch the ball. But he was just like an extension of a coach. He was always there. He was there the most. You'd go in on Tuesday or a day, you get an off day, and you'd still go in to get your workout in. I didn't like to go in on Wednesday before practice. I'd rather just get my workout in on Tuesday anyway, even though it was off. And Rich would always have been there for a few hours. I'm just thinking, man. You know, what kind of life do you have? But I was thinking the wrong way. <laughs> I should have been thinking I should have been there more, you know. But, I mean, that's just the kind of guy he was. And he was always respectful. You know, I remember him always reading, like, um, uh, Us Weekly and funny funny um, magazines on the plane just to relax. He was really into movies and stuff. And you wouldn't expect it because he's a guru of football. You think he'd be reading his playbook. But he got to relax whenever he was flying to the game. He'd be reading different um magazine periodical things and he was really into the, the culture the, things like that i remember of rich and and uh, i stayed in contact with him i invited him i used to do golf tournaments for many years he's like hey i heard you the don donald trump of golf tournaments i remember him saying that i invited him but he was uh, he wasn't in the state at the time but um he i always stayed in contact with him you know even after he announced um as a as an announcer, I was I just hear him talk, and I'd heard him talk so much, and I've heard Gruden talk so much. I enjoy listening to them, but I'm like I've heard this so much. I can hear somebody <laughs> whisper, and I know it's their voice. I mean, you know it. You've heard it so much, already so much detail, and they're just so uh, you know so detailed with football. It's he was a great leader. He would hide the pool balls, and they used to have a, a pool ball. Uh, pool table the, the players would go and play It'd be like Woodson a lot of the defensive players would play during lunch where you know Gannon would go and hide the, the pool table because he'd want guys to focus I, I also remember him a lot Kansas City was very strict they didn't allow Oakland was pretty lenient under Al Davis you were expected to get your job done you're in a man you're an adult you get it done you just did you know you, you got a little leeway but you got your job done where at Kansas City they were very strict they didn't give you that leeway, like you got your job done. They told you how to get your job done, and there was no like being loud at lunch or <clears throat> showing not showing up late because nobody showed up late, but j- just a little more lax. Kansas City was known back then under Schottenheimer as being like you know military. So Gannon had a hard time at first, you know, just getting used to the Raider way where the players and Al Davis are really important. Also, it's not just a coach. You know, so that's just, just a different environment because Mr. Davis was so famous and so powerful so many years. For most programs, a lot of time, it's the coach that has the power. And they have these managers that are, are very wealthy and smart, but maybe not as big name, you know, not as big. So you know, that that was a bit different. Uh, so Gannon had a little adjustment to that, but, you know, he was such a good runner. He, he came out of Delaware where they ran, believe it or not, wing T, very heavy wing T. I didn't even know that until I was – you know, studying wing tee for high school football. And I'm looking at Delaware, and I'm watching an old video from a coach, like, in the early 80s, mid-80s, bragging about his NFL players. Now, it must have been mid-90s, uh, the, the video. And he's bragging about Rich Gannon and how he's in Minnesota. And I'm like, wow, Rich was in wing tee. Because I remember when he came out, they were trying to move Rich to defensive back in the NFL. But he could run. He was super smart. He had a good arm. and But he could run. I remember so many times just – you know, times when he'd make plays with his feet, you know, that weren't designed runs, that he would save the day for us and run 15, 20 yards first down. He never looked to run, but he'd take the run if it was there. And I just think he was very dangerous because he was a passer first, but people didn't know he was from a wing tee, so he could run. You know, and so to me, that, but he was just an extension of a coach. I mean, you got close with him, and I was close with him, but he was like a coach. I mean, he was a lot older, and he was, you know, He'd been in the league a long time, and people respected him, but he was like a, a mini coach as opposed to most of the players. You know, there's a couple other players, but most of the time, you, you, you know, you're, you're more of a player. He was just so knowledgeable. He was like a coach. But being in the huddle with him was just, you know, you, you got it done. He, he was your best buddy. He was wanting you to do good. He thought you were good. He let you know. He's like, Jeremy, you know, you're next year. You're going to a million-dollar contract if you get this done, blah, blah, blah. I mean, he would say random stuff. I'm like, do you think that highly of me? Like, I don't even think that highly of me. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> But he, you know, in your mind, you're thinking that. But then if you did it wrong, what the heck? I remember one time it, it was on a game against the Titans, and it was on, like, 
Monday Night Football. It might have been Thursday Night Football when they do that. And he called the play wrong with Spider 2 Y banana, but he called Spider 2 U banana. Um, and it was on the wrong side. He called it like strong right. The Y would be on the right. No, it was sorry. It was like ace right. Two tight ends is ace. So the, the, that, the X, the second tight end, the U, would be on the left. And he called ace left U uh, Y banana. Uh, but it was it's right. He, he called it incorrectly. So I didn't run the banana. He's like, you should have run the banana. And I'm like, you called it incorrectly. He did that. But he was screaming at me on the sideline. <laughs> and after he goes, oh, yeah, you're right. I did call it incorrectly. You know, I probably should have just called run it the right way. <laughs> but I did it exactly as he called it. You know, I just did it exactly as he called it, dude. Because I just, I don't, and I should have, if I knew that the concept really well, I would have just disregarded what he said and run my own thing. But I was younger. And I'm like, nope. So I remember he ripped me. He's like, oh, hey, you're right. And he told me that. But he ripped me for like 10 seconds on the sideline. Everybody to this day would keep saying, hey, what was Quinn ripping on you? Or no, what was Gannon ripping on you about? And it was just funny because they catch one part of it. And then the other part is like, oh, hey, you're right. I did do that. You know, but it was just, you know, things like that. But he, you never, you just knew it was him and his perfection. He wanted to get it done. You didn't take it like Gannon doesn't like me. You got like a dude. I got to get stuff done. Guy can't get sacked on my watch. This can't be me. Yeah. Giving up the sack. You know, that was another thing that was great that he could run because he'd save you at times. A lot of times I'd be on a tight end blocking on the backside, protecting against a really good defensive end, you know, and he could use his feet sometimes. You're like, oh, oh, he's almost going to hit him. And then you get out. You're like, Phew. and then, you know, as long as the game was good, nobody would talk about that, you know. But although Gruden sometimes, he'd come in. Sorry, to jump to Gruden. He he come in. You never knew because he was up at three seventeen, and, and there was rumors that Gannon would be down there like four seventeen, like an hour after him. But Gruden would come in some mornings, and you'd be watching, and you could see his face would be bloodshot, and he'd be chewing tobacco, and he'd have a big cup of coffee in his hand, and you'd be like, uh oh, he'd just be zing, he'd zing you. I dropped the ball in in walkthrough, and it was raining. I'm like the first pass in walkthrough, you're not even warmed up. He's like, it doesn't rain in Washington, does it, Brigham? Like. Every once in a while, he would, you know, if he was up all night and he was drinking coffee, you know, you'd be watching film all of a sudden and he'd be critiquing that backside pass that you're protecting that Gannon didn't get hit, but he could have got hit. And Gruden would just go into detail on Zinnia. And then other times they'd let it fly, you know. So it just, if Gruden was hit or miss, but it was always positive, you know. That's another thing I don't know if a lot of guys share. It's like you watch practice, you in practice. And then you watch practice film after you're just during the season, you have one long practice and the walkthrough and all that other stuff, but you'd watch your film after with your position coach for two hours. So if you drop a pass, you get yelled at in meetings with your position coach. And then you come in in the morning and watch it in the offensive meetings. And then every once in a while, Gruden would come in and watch it with the whole group. So you'd have watched practice three times. Man. And my leg would be twitching. Like, yeah, it's just the detail. Like if you if something happened, then the next you're walking it with your tight end coach, and then the next day you're watching it with the offensive coach, and then Gruden would talk about it after. So it's like you just had to be thick skinned. You had to learn to be thick skinned in the NFL and deal with criticism, and you know just get results. But you always knew they liked you because they drafted you, and it was their job to make you better because you make them look good. So. It's just different than all other levels of football because there's like an ownership there where they, they look good if you look good and they want to develop you. And then especially part of the Raiders, there's a camaraderie of the Raider draft picks. And so it's just, it's just different. But, you know, going back to Gannon, he was just an ultimate professional. And, you know, that, like a coach, he was the only guy that was like Gruden's buddy, but also, you know, every once in a while they'd argue, which you never see in the NFL except on the sidelines and those highlight videos and everybody's like, wow, somebody's yelling at their coach where they would yell, but it would be in a walkthrough some passionate that they were arguing about, about what somebody did, you know? Yeah. So it was a, a utmost respect. You just respected him. You, you didn't look at him like Gannon about Jerry Rice or those guys. Cause Gannon kind of talked like he was equal with you and he was just a worker. You, you, you admired him big time and he was MVP one year and he's just super great, but he was a really humble, good guy. So he didn't have that big a presence. He was just, he'd work hard and he just, he wanted to be one of the guys yet. He was breaking records and, and doing great things. So he just, 
you didn't feel an awe around him because he didn't make you do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so let's uh let's go to two thousand, uh, week seventeen. Uh, y'all are in Oakland and the Panthers are in town. Uh, and, and when y'all win this game in a route, y'all become the AFC West champions. I think for the first time since like the nineties, early nineties. Yep. Um, and so you had two touchdowns in that game. That was your first and second career touchdowns. Yep. Right. And so can you take us through that play? What was that spider? Y two banana or? Yeah. yeah, it was it was a it was a you banana it was you banana or you drag I yeah, drove you drag you dragged yeah I dragged it was like Tim Brown or or Tim Brown dragged over the top of me and I was underneath and I just remember Gannon throwing that ball and I was like oh my gosh I jabbed the linebacker I feel like Lester Towns or somebody from who actually played at Washington and was on Panthers. And I jabbed it, and then um, he looked at me and threw it, and I felt like that ball was in the air forever. And I reached out, and I grabbed it, and I just remember holding on with your life to it because it's at home, and the Raider crazies are there, and you're just dreaming about it. And so I'd always – we watched a video that year in training camp about celebrations. Gruden actually put it on. So it was like – it was just a funny, you know, break the ice in the middle of training camp and when you're watching like your 10th hour of film that day. Uh, Gruden brings in a film like celebration video, like touchdown catch celebration. So I'm like, hey, I'm gonna fake, I'm gonna fake a spike, and then I'm gonna just jump shot the ball through the goalpost yeah. when I score my first one. And then I was like, I was like dunking the ball. So, so that first one, I, I caught it and just by reaction in my mind, I went and fake spiked it and I shot it through the goalpost. That was my celebration. Well, like two quarters later, I caught another one. It was um, a corner route, and uh, <clears throat> it was. Um, a corner route I caught and I, I, I beat the guy late on a corner post to the, to the end zone. And one of our running backs tried to grab the ball in my hand. I just remember squeezing it in the pile and coming to the ground. Um, Zach Crockett was yeah. his name. And yeah. uh, he tried to pull it out too. Cause it was kind of both there, but I was like, I'm taking this thing. I ripped it right <laughs> out. I caught it, but he tried to yank it out in the pile, you know, well, not he yank won. it out, but like if that ball's here. This is a touchdown. You're going to do that, you know, cause you don't know if the defender's doing that. So I just remember holding on to it and pulling it in, getting another touchdown in that game. And then I'm like, all right, I'm going. And I went, ran all the way over and dunked it through the goalpost. Uh, and I, and I, I normally dunk, you know, really easy because I had a pretty good vertical leap. But uh, I jumped and I was, I dunked it, but it was just kind of a, just kind of a like kind of a weak dunk. I still dunked it, but I, I was surprised, you know, I didn't have the perfect timing. But I dunked it, dunked it, and then uh, I almost had a third one, but it was a penalty. But um, it was, yeah, it was just one of those games where. It, Gannon would do that. He he trusted my hands. I didn't, you know, have the longest career because I hurt my knee in my fifth season. But, you know, had had I stayed around with Gannon, um, he liked me because he knew I had good hands. I would not let him down catching the ball. You know, I wasn't perfect. I was an average blocker, but I could catch any ball you threw to me wherever you threw it. And we were at a camp, the same one in, in Hawaii, and they announced, hey, Jeremy Brigham, the guy with the best hands on the Raiders. And I remember Gannon was there, and Tim Brown was there, and nobody looked weird when they said it. Not that I was the best receiver, but I could catch. And that was just one thing that, you know, he just liked having a guy, you know, you're not going to catch a ton, but he knew I would catch. So I know he liked that as, as, a, as a quarterback. Cool. So did you, get a, did you get the game ball out of that game? Yeah, you got the game ball. It might have changed, but back then, believe it or not, you had to pay like 75 bucks if you wanted the game ball. <laughs> they gave you the option. Yeah. <laughs> so everything there, like – and you may have talked to players and said, like, you'd get two tickets back then. You'd have to pay. If they were home, the team would give you two. But away, you'd have to pay. So when your family asks you for eight tickets, it's, you know, what is that? Six, one hundred bucks? Probably more than that now. Yeah. You had to pay $75 to get the ball stamped if you wanted to. So, of course, those two games, I, I said, heck yes. So I got the game balls stamped with the date, time, and all that. That's cool, man. So, yeah. First and the equipment guy comes time. right over. Heck yeah, I want this game ball. Put it down over here. You know, I don't want to say no. Of course I want it. So, but yeah, I remember those. I remember those games. Um, it was Christmas Eve, and I bought my wife a big um, china cabinet. And I did it as a secret. Uh, I put it in the in the house. So after the game, and I always do stuff like, if we don't win, I want to have a backup plan. So I had a fun – we had to win that game – 
we had to win that to win the bye week because we were expected to not get the bye as the top two teams. But Denver loses in the last game to Seattle this way back then. And so they ended up not having the bye if we win. So all of a sudden the Carolina game became, if we win this, we win the bye week for the, for the playoffs. So it was a huge game. So I remember I bought, I bought an, a big, you know, big thing in the kitchen for my, for my wife. And I had it there. There was a big China cabinet. And when it came back after the game, it was there. And she was just so excited that I had it. It was wrapped with a big bow, Merry Christmas and everything. It was just one of those nights. My dad was there. My dad who's passed away since recently. And, you know, it was just, and ended up trying to get out of driving out of the um, Raider stadium. And there was like a roadblock with the cops to let people out. You know, my mother-in-law was there. And I, I, so I just drove up to the cop. I'm like, Hey, I scored two touchdowns today with the Raiders. Can you let me through? And the guy recognized me and let me through the cop yeah. because it was a roadblock getting, getting out of the stadium. But it was just a random, one of those surreal, you know, lifetime moments yeah. that it happened real quick. Yeah, you know? That's cool, man. Yeah. Okay. Getting both in the same game was cool, too. So in 2002, right, you were injured, right? But you made it back for the Super Bowl? Yep, yep. It hurt my knee versus the 49ers. Um, and so I was out, and then I came back. Mr. Davis called me back, and I worked out with Gannon, and then I came back for that uh, that year. So is that the reason uh, 2002 was your last year, your knee? Yes. Yeah, I um, tore cartilage in my knee and uh, completely different. I know bone-to-bone cartilage. So if you don't have cartilage you know, and you're a sprinter running fast guy and that's your strength, it changes everything. Mm. So I was able to come back, but I knew, I knew leaving that that was probably my last game when I walked out of the Super Bowl. It was another surreal. I'm walking out like, look around because this is probably it. And I'm just trying to soak everything up. So it was just one of those other moments that you don't want to have, but, you know, I knew my knee was not good. Yeah, well, that was a dark day for all of us, man. So I'm yep, sorry your yep. career ended like that, dude. Yep, yep. It you was know. tough, but, you know, it's life happens certain ways, and, you know, my life would have been different, you know, and a lot of different good things and a lot of not good things. So, you know, yeah. I don't have any regrets on that. No, and you should. At the time, I was bummed. At the time, I was bummed, but it's motivated me to be a better coach. And it's motivated me to be a better father. I was looking at things a lot differently when I was a player. So I look at things differently now in life. Well, that's awesome. So yep. when that – at that time, you know, I mean, did you start setting goals? You know, what were your goals? Did be a better family man or, you know, when did you decide to get into coaching? I know that you had the Out of Bounds show. How long did that yeah. last? Yeah, yeah, that was that was really cool. That was with uh, I, I had a lot of connections in the Bay Area, you know, a lot of friends afterward. I just stayed in contact with people, and to that about thing, I we got to go interview people, and in, in, um, you know, George Lopez, you know, Clint Eastwood, and these were a lot of times they were Raider people. I would get connected to them through my Raider contact. You know, I remember interviewing Lopez at length, and I went up and said I was with, with Raider TV. <laughs> <laughs> and I got this long interview from Lopez. And he was a George Lopez. He was a huge Raider fan. Oh, yeah. That was that show. So that lasted about six months. And I was doing like some producing and stuff in the Bay Area. But I was just in the producing room. And it, it became so time consuming. You're not making any money. Um, you're actually losing money <laughs> um, with the production company. <laughs> yeah, you know. So it's like the passion was there. But I'm sitting in there and I'm doing a lot of the work. And I'm like, wait a second, this is really cool. Like you feel good. You feel like you're accomplishing it, but it's not producing a lot of return with equal return with the money. Yeah. So that I, I stopped doing that because the money, the sponsorships kind of, kind of dried up. So that, but that was a blast on um, that show. There's a lot of celebrities in the bear and it was a lot of fun. Um, but you know, and then um, with the, with the coaching, um, Fred Bolitnikoff, the great receiver, I called him for advice, um, and he said, you know, I just went down to the local junior college because I was pretty close to Fred Belinikoff, and he's a legend, and he was one of our coaches. And he's like, I went down to the local junior college, and I just hung out there and told him I wanted to get a job, and that's a good start, you know. 
that's what I did. So I said, well, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. So I went down to Chabot College and Diablo Valley College, both in the Bay Area. One's in Walnut Creek, one's in uh, Hayward, San Leandro era. And Diablo Valley said they had a position next year for me for receiver coach. And I'm sorry, you went out. So Diablo had a wide receiving coach for you? Yep. And um, Chabot College had it that week. And Diablo's was the next year, so I I signed on with Chabot College. Me and Steve Wisniewski, he was a great lineman for the Raiders. Yeah, he lives he in came Austin. With, yeah, oh, he does now? Okay. Yeah. I know he's in, he came down with me, and um, I was there for about a week or so, and then Steve came, and he came for about two days, and then he, he got snatched up by Harbaugh and went to Stanford. Um, but I ended up staying at Chabot because I really liked it. That's where a lot of the good players, like I said, Blitnikoff got to start, um, you know, junior college. So I started there for two or three years, and we won two bowl championships they hadn't been. And then I moved to Arizona and coached at a junior college there, and we won the first bowl game they ever won in 50 years. My coaching has always been my strength is the Bill Callahan. He was the head coach of the Raiders, you know, and he was my tight end coach. He's just offensive line guru. The details of blocking that they break down, it's like – you know, getting a Harvard degree in zone blocking, that you don't realize it. So you go and you talk to football with other people about blocking, and you're like, the guy's got no clue. You know, it's just so – that's just something I've always leaned on, a strong offensive line. I've always been the offensive line coach uh, and coordinator most of the time. But – so that's how I got into coaching. It was Callahan. I did some youth football coaching uh, and just really, really enjoyed it. It's like golf. I just kind of lose myself, and I'm – at practice and I'm not thinking about anything else. Even when there's a really bad day and in life, practice, you're not thinking about that bad day. You're just practicing. And then when practice is over, you remember, oh, I forgot I had that bad day or I had that good day. But so that's the only thing really, you know, other than sitting around watching UFC videos or fun movies at night, that's enjoyable. But other than that, football <laughs> is, you know, football is like you get lost in it. I'm sure it's just like what you're doing with your show, and I've heard it. It's very, very successful. You're really good with your interviews. Thank you. And you get lost in it, you know, oh, yeah. in what you're doing. So it's the same type of thing. Where coaching to me, I get more lost in it than as a player. As a player, it's your body, your fatigue, and, you know, you you love it. You're doing great, but, you know, it's more work. As a coach, it's still work, but it's just you, you just enjoy it more. You know, you, you appreciate it more, too. As a player, you're just – you're there and you maybe think this is how it is for everybody. But as a coach, you've lived longer and you know, like I should be grateful for this opportunity. And so I just, I really like coaching. It's just that feeling of trying to win. And, and but it's that Raider being really positive. I just always stay positive. Even if we're losing every game, I'm trying to find a way to win. I, I never like the coaches that say it's all about the talent. And, and 90% of coaches out there, high school, college oh it's all about the talent we're gonna lose today we're gonna win today that's never the raider way it's like okay we might be expected to lose but we're gonna think about all the ways we can win yeah and that's just the raider way well maybe that's embedded in my head that you can win anything because everybody's equal in the nfl but i just as a coach i've taken that same attitude and blitnikoff got me into it but i stay in contact with gruden i asked him last year because i went to the manning academy in new orleans uh, for a few years, a passing camp, um, like 10 years ago, eight years ago, and looked up passing academies. And I was like, where could I go volunteer? And the top one was Manning that popped in. So I called him up, and the coach was a former coach of Stanford, and he knew me. Uh, Buddy Stevens is his name. He's now at Dartmouth. And he's like, I can't, you can't volunteer, but. So they paid me to go out and be a team coach at the mini camp. And there's like all the top college players. I remember Andrew Luck was was there one of the years. And so that was a great experience, you know, doing stuff like that. But I just got you know, doing those type of events and being involved and um, you know, from learning from those type of people the this aspect of, you know, quarterbacking and, and different things that I thought made me a better coach. Cool. Now, uh, you were kind of breaking up a little bit. I could hear what you were saying, though. So, I guess, you know, we could go ahead and end the call. Okay.
But, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 I want to thank you for coming on. You know, I'm sorry that the reception's you. bad right now. That's okay. And um, however you want to do it, man. I'm just, I'm happy. You need, you need my help, and I'm happy to be on. Um, you to mesh me with somebody else, or or have me do it. But I just, uh, you know, I really appreciate what you're doing for the Raiders. Um, you know, it's it's really good. Uh, there's other. Um, there's a friend of mine. He's a Raider pastor, Pastor Mondo. Um, he's a really good guy. He's a good Christian guy, but he's walked the life, and he, he knows a lot about the old Raiders. He might be somebody that I could connect you to, would have a lot of good those good Al stories oh. from the inside of the old Southern California stadium in, in with the black hole and all that. But there's just, a, there's just a lot of good things. But, you know, I really respect you. Hello? You have a lot of passion for it. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. You said you really respect what I was doing. Let's hear that again because you were breaking up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said I really respect what you're doing. I, I listened to some of your interviews. You have a really good passion. It's just kind of a down-to-earth Raider thing. I can tell you're a true Raider guy. Sometimes you listen and you think somebody's – but you, you just have a true passion. You just have a genuine good feeling about the Raiders. So I just wanted to – my opinion, you know, you're great at this. Man, you, man, I can't believe you're break. I can hear you, but you're breaking up a lot. Okay. So I, I really so, appreciate the compliments, man. The compliments, you know, it means a lot, man. It really does. You got it. And, and uh, anything, I, anything I can do anytime, you don't don't hesitate to ask. All right, cool. Well, one time I would like to get you and Coach Hanson on together. I'd love to. All right, he's cool. wonderful. Anytime you you want to set it up, just tell me when I'll be there. All right, cool. Well, thank you very much. Okay, see you, bud. Bye-bye. Bye.